<laughs> hey, regarding the, uh, the inductive Bible study uh, seminar, let me talk about that for a minute. You know, one of the, uh, I guess, the vision of our church is to help every Christian to have a, have a, a deeper walk with Jesus. You know, I mean, if we, don't, if we don't help people do that, you know, we're nothing more than a club, basically. And so one of the best things you can do as an individual person is learn how to get into the Word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. It says the same anointing which you have received will teach you all things. And, but it's important that you learn how to open up the Scripture and read it and study it. And what, what you're going to learn at that seminar are simple Bible study techniques. And it's not like you're not going to go through like Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. A very simple process for being able to read the scripture and break it down and then draw out from the word what he's actually saying. And then at the end of that, there will be um, a, a section where they're going to talk about how to, how to actually put together Bible studies uh, using that methodology. So if you're a person who's doing a Bible study or or planning to, or leading a Bible study group, or something like that, uh, you would benefit from it. But we want, we want people to really get into the Word of God on their own and learn. Let the Lord teach you some things. If all of your teaching that you get in the Bible comes from what you hear on Sunday morning, you're going to be a very weak person spiritually. You've got to get into the Word on your own and let the Lord develop that. So I want to encourage you along those lines. Okay, let's open up our Bible to Luke chapter 7, and I'm going to pray concerning the word of the Lord today. We're going to look at Luke chapter 7. Okay, Father, I ask you this morning to open your word to us by your spirit. Father, teach us. Help us to see something about Jesus we've never seen before. Lord, illuminate our hearts and help us to grasp something about your character, how you think about us, Lord. And stir our hearts to be hungry for your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 7, I'm going to read, we're going to really look at uh, just a portion of this today, first couple, maybe 28 verses and it's a really unusual thing that happens in this particular chapter. It's, it's almost like something's turned upside down, topsy-turvy. And it's a story about a centurion who was a Roman. He wasn't really one of God's people. He was a Roman, kind of like Cornelius in the book of Acts. He was a, a Roman centurion. He wasn't really a follower of Jesus. But he was a man who had a heart for God. He gave money and helped to build a tabernacle or a, or a synagogue. And so did this particular centurion. But of this centurion, even though he wasn't one of the people of God, the Bible says that Jesus spoke about him and said, there's nobody with greater faith in all Israel. And it seems odd to me that a, a person who's not one of the people of God would be looked at by Jesus as having greater faith than anybody in Israel. Isn't that weird? And then we're going to look at another man at the end of this chapter who's called John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, Jesus described as a man like this. There's no one greater than John the Baptist. But we're going to find in this story that John the Baptist began to have doubts about Jesus. And so we have a person who's one of the greatest men of all time, according to Jesus, who's struggling with doubt, and a man who wasn't even one of God's people who had greater faith than anybody in Israel. And so what we're going to look at this morning is how Jesus interacted with different people, whether they had faith or whether they had doubts. You know, Jesus still interacts with us regardless of where we're at. And I would imagine sitting in this room today, there are people that are struggling with doubt, maybe about their faith, maybe about is the Bible true, I mean, maybe, maybe all this stuff really isn't real. Maybe, maybe, maybe when I die, there won't be a heaven. I mean, these doubts sometimes come into your heart. Or maybe you're a person here who's really trying to grow in faith. But I just want you to know that 
Jesus Christ interacts with each one of us regardless of where we are on that, on that continuum of faith and doubt. Jesus is very much moved by our faith or lack of it. And we'll see that from the scripture today. The title of the message today is called Jesus Marveled. All right, Luke 7, verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued to him. This wasn't just a servant that, you know, this one dies, no big deal, I got 10 more. This was one who was very valued in the eyes of this centurion. He was sick, he was at the point of death. When the centurion, and here's a key word I'm talking about today, when the centurion heard about Jesus, you might want to underline that in your Bible or think about it. I'm going to talk about today the importance of hearing some things. When he heard about Jesus, he sent him elders of the Jews. And here's another important word I'm going to talk about today, asking him. I'm going to talk to you today about asking Jesus some things, hearing about some things and asking some things. These are all, these are all the ways this centurion was processing his, what I'm calling a desperate need. He heard about Jesus and he sent some people to ask him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, well, he's worthy to have you do this for him. How many of you know that Jesus doesn't come because we are worthy to have him do something for us? Somehow these guys are thinking, I'm going to negotiate with Jesus. If I can somehow convince Jesus that he's worthy enough, maybe Jesus will answer his prayer. Sometimes we slip into that mentality ourselves. Well, Lord, I'm worthy enough. Or sometimes we feel like I'm not worthy enough. Maybe I won't even ask. But anyhow, these guys were trying to negotiate with Jesus. You ought to go and heal this boy because the man is worthy. He loves our nation. He's the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy. Wait, wait a minute, the, the Jewish people said, he is worthy to have you do this for him, and he says, I'm not worthy to have you come. Who's right? I think the centurion had it right. It was a humility that was in his life, and that's important to what I'm sp speaking about today concerning faith. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. And here's another very key thing I'm talking about this morning is but say the word. Say the word. Who is saying the word here? It's Jesus. He's asking Jesus, say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, listen to this, he marveled at him. When Jesus heard how this centurion who didn't feel worthy came to him and spoke these words about his position in the army, he was saying, I'm a man under authority and I have authority and I can say to this man, go and he goes and another man come and he comes. When this guy understood the principles of authority and submission and like a, a command structure, Jesus marveled at that. And it really is a key to understanding faith. In the military, if your soldier, if your, if your lieutenant walks up to you and says, soldier, run over there, what do you do? You run over there. You don't ask questions. You don't negotiate, you know, why you shouldn't do it. He's a man under authority, and when his commander says go, he goes. And this guy understood that. And he knew there was no one greater than Jesus. And he said, Lord, if you can just stand up here and say it, I know something's going to happen because I understand authority. And he understand there was no greater authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that it took a man who was a Roman centurion, not even one of God's people, to understand this principle 
But all Jesus had to do was speak it. The words of Christ created the worlds. The Bible says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus created the entire universe by just speaking it into existence. And now he's saying, Lord, speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And when Jesus heard these words, he marveled at him. And then turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Now, I don't know how big of a geographic area that was, but think about this. If Jesus heard you say something, and he turned around to the crowd that was following him and says, I've not heard so much greater faith in all of Alliance or all of Stark County or all of Ohio. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? And that's what he was saying about this centurion servant. In all Israel, I have not found such faith. And when those who had sent had been sent turned to the house, they found the servant well. Jesus healed him. So I want to talk about four things this morning very quickly about this faith. Where did it come from? How did it grow in this man's life? First thing is, I think faith comes oftentimes on the heels of having a desperate need. We're afraid of being in desperate need. We've heard this morning some testimonies of people who had answered prayers. Some of those prayers were desperate. Some of them were not. But oftentimes it's when we're in a desperate place that we see faith stirred in our heart because we know we're, we're beyond our ability to do anything. This centurion, even though he was a great man, a man of authority, a powerful man, a great leader, he was at a situation in his life that he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't heal his servant. Many times we're self-sufficient. We figure out if I have a problem, I'll, I'll solve it myself. And sometimes I think the Lord brings us into desperate situations where we say, Lord, there's really nothing else I can do. I need to turn to you. That's, that's like a spark of faith. It's a seed where faith can begin to grow, where we're beyond our ability, where it's out of our control. It's out of our hands. There's no other resource I have, no other place I can turn. And so maybe, Lord, I'm going to turn to you. And so if the, Lord, if the Lord brings you into desperate situations, and if it's for the purpose of stirring up faith in your heart, you should say, praise God for it. That was happening in this man's life, a desperate need. The next thing I'm going to talk about is hearing. I don't know what it is exactly, but there's something miraculous and I say it's miraculous, I, I see it in the scripture. Something miraculous happens in the heart of a person when we hear. Does that sound weird to you? Listen to what the Bible says. Faith comes from hearing. Who would have ever thought that faith would come from hearing? You know, all of us that are sitting here today that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we've been born again. That was a miracle in our life of new birth. The Holy Spirit came and dwelled inside of us and made us a new creation. You know how it happened? Because somebody preached the gospel to us, and we heard it. We heard the words of the gospel. We heard the words of Christ, and something happened inside of our hearts that stirred faith, and we believed. Hearing stirs faith. And this man heard about Jesus. I wonder what things he heard about Jesus. Maybe he was hearing about Jesus healing the sick or cleansing a leper or feeding the 5,000 or who knows what all these stories were. But somehow in this man's life, maybe it was a person at work. Maybe it was on the streets. Maybe it was just somebody sharing a testimony. But throughout his life, he started hearing these stories about this amazing teacher you know, and how God works in his life, and look at how he's touched people's lives. And so when he was in a place of desperation in his own life, when there was no place else to turn, what came into his heart was, I've heard about Jesus. And I'm telling you guys, this is one of the reasons why it is so important for us to continually share our testimony Amen. and tell people the good things the Lord is doing. Maybe it's not even in your life, but tell, hey, 
If you're at work tomorrow, you were talking about, uh, talking about being, you know, more on with the Lord wherever you're at. If you're at work tomorrow, tell somebody, you know what, I was at church yesterday and somebody stood up and God answered their prayer. They've been praying for a, a car for two years, you know, and God blessed them. What that's doing is people are starting to hear, they're hearing about Jesus. They're hearing things. And there's going to come a day in that person's life when they're going to get desperate. And, what, and they're going to be out of their resources. And they're not going to know where to turn. And maybe something they heard from you, a testimony, something to glorify Jesus will spark in their heart. And they've heard about Jesus. And now they're saying, I'm going to turn to him. He did that for that person. Maybe, they'll do, maybe he'll do it for me. And so hearing is so important. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There was another story in Mark chapter 5. It talks about a, a woman uh, this is in chapter 5, verse 25. A woman had a discharge of blood for 12 years. How many of you know, women, that is a major deal? A discharge of blood for 12 years. That sounds like a desperate place, doesn't it? It says in verse 26, she had suffered much under many physicians. That sounds like a bad deal, doesn't it? And then it says... She spent all that she had. That sounds like a really bad deal. Not only did she have a discharge of blood for 12 years, she suffered at the hands of many physicians. She gave all of her money to try to get better. And the Bible says she was no better, but rather grew worse. Isn't that awesome? What's happening here? He's, she's coming to the place of desperation. There's no place else to turn. But look at verse 27. It says, she had heard the reports about Jesus. See, she heard something. She heard about Jesus. Somehow, after all this struggle, all this trial, all these hardships, she remembered, I've heard about Jesus. And the Bible says that she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. You know what that was? Faith. Faith was coming up in this woman's heart because just because she heard about Jesus, she heard about him and she was wondering, maybe he'll do something for me if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Yes, I'm in a desperate place. And thank God for her desperation. I mean, I'm saying that, you know, in, in the right way. I'm not trying to be weird about it. But, you know, she had never gone through all those trials, 12 years with the blood, lost all of her money, suffered at the hands of physicians. She never would have turned to Jesus. But in this moment, in this dark, despairing time of her life, she heard about him. And there's so much hope and faith that comes when people just hear about Jesus. Glorify him. Talk about him. Talk about his greatness. Talk about his love. Talk about his mercy. Talk about his grace. Share your testimony. Look at the things the Lord has done in my life. And people will hear this and somewhere in their life, somewhere down the line, when they are at their desperate time, they might, just like this lady, say, if I, could just touch his, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, wouldn't that be awesome? That a person's life could be touched just by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. The next thing is a centurion asked. You don't have to raise your hand, but if I was to, if I was to ask, how many of you hate to ask people for help I would probably get a lot of people raising their hand. Somehow we get into this mode of hating to ask. I'll do it on my own. I'm not worthy to ask or whatever. You know, the Lord wants us to ask. The book of James says, you have not because you ask not. What's the greatest thing you've asked the Lord for lately? There was a man in Mark 10 called Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. That sounds like a desperate situation to me. Jesus said to him, this guy came to Jesus, and don't you think it would be obvious why he was coming? How many guys? Is that you, Lord? Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do for you? What did the Lord want? He wants him to ask. He just wants us to ask. And it's not like he's on some kind of a pride trip. He just wants us to recognize that we need him and we ask him. 
I, it's beyond my ability, Lord. Can you please help me? I need a job. I need some food. I need a place to live. I need help to overcome the sin in my life. We've got to ask. We have not because we ask not. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And then it says in Ephesians 3.20, to him who is able to do, listen to this, it's hard, it's hard to believe that he says this, he is able to do far more abundantly. The King James says it this way, exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power at work in us. And so I challenge us, what is the greatest thing you've asked the Lord for this week? I joke about it, but I think it's probably true for many of us. Lord, bless my food that we are about to partake of. Thank you for meeting our needs. What do you need? What's going on in your life? Are there desperate situations? How many here have a desperate situation? Ask. Ask. You've heard about Jesus. Start asking. He wants to glorify himself. The last thing I'll share about the centurion is he simply understood the authority of Christ when he said, speak only the words and my servant will be healed. Ultimately, I think faith comes because we know that he is the one who answers our prayer. We seek him. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Yeah, he gives us authority. He gives us spiritual gifts. But you know, even that is his doing. We, we should never, ever come to the place where you think, of, oh, I prayed for this person, they were healed, that you had anything to do with it, other than, <laughs> other than you were obedient to what the Lord asked you to do. We have authority because we're under authority. But he's the speaker. He spoke. And part of our ability to be uh, wise in praying for the sick is hearing what is he saying Lord what is it you're doing what do you want to do in this situation because he is the speaker that, that, that gives me a lot of faith because it takes me out of the equation altogether if I pray for the sick I might be sitting here thinking man I have a little bit of doubt here but Lord this is what you told us to do heal this person I'm out of the equation you speak the word and my servant will be healed so, Jesus marveled at this. I love it when somehow God's heart is touched. When you see glimpses of that in the scripture. Jesus marveled. I want to talk just a minute about this, about what it means to marvel. The word means to admire, to wonder. Like an amazement. Most of the time that word is used in the Bible, it's describing man marveling at the great works of Jesus. Like some examples, the wind and the sea obey him. Remember that story? They were out on the boat, the wind was going, the, the apostles were all afraid they were going to drown. Jesus stands up, he rebukes the wind immediately. The wind and the waves stop. I mean, that's amazing. And the Bible says they marveled that even the wind and the sea would obey him. Do you see that amazement that comes? Wow, Lord, that's what this word is when it says Jesus marveled at this centurion, it's like, wow. It's like it blew his mind in a way. When the lame man was told to pick up his bed and walk, it says the multitude that was gathered there marveled at this. And one time there was a devil cast out of a man so that he could now speak. He was a dumb man. And once the devil was coming out, he was able to speak. And the people that were standing there marveled. And there's scripture after scripture about how people marveled at these magnificent works of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus marveled when this man had faith. And there's two times in the Bible it talks about Jesus marveling. And they're both around faith. One of them is this, the centurion who had greater faith than anybody in Israel. And you remember the other time that Jesus marveled? It says he came to his own hometown and he marveled 
that they had no faith. That also marveled him, that somehow with all that he is and all that he came to bring and all of his testimony and all of his greatness and all of his glory, that somehow these people couldn't see it. You're just a carpenter's son. And Jesus marveled at their unbelief. The next part of this story, I'm moving pretty quick here, folks. The next part of this story is in Luke 7, verse 11. Afterwards, he went to a town called Nain. His disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So this was a, a woman who lost everyone. Her husband had already died. She was a widow. This was her only son. He's being carried out on a stretcher to be buried. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Now, this story is very different than the centurion. It doesn't say that she heard about Jesus. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that she was asking about Jesus. It doesn't even say that she sent people to ask Jesus to come. It's just that Jesus, out of his compassion, totally apart from any input from this woman, out of his compassion, raised a boy from the dead. I'm sharing this because I believe that sometimes we feel like we've got to somehow talk the Lord into doing things in our life. That somehow I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough. I'm not right enough. I'm not good enough, or I'm not this or that. Jesus has compassion. He is the God of compassion. And without anything from this woman, just that he looked over there, he saw the situation, it was a desperate thing, and he was moved, the Bible says, with compassion to walk over to this woman and said, don't be afraid. And he spoke, again, he spoke to this boy, and the Bible says he was raised from the dead. I praise God that we have a God of compassion like this. I think we take way too much on ourselves that somehow I play a bigger role in what God's doing than, than that, that, we, that we really should take any credit for. A lot of times he does things in spite of us. How many have found that to be true in your life? He does things in spite of ourselves. So take the pressure off. I mean, let's have faith, but let's realize that the Lord is a God of compassion with us. I want to close up by talking about doubt now for a minute. John the Baptist, the disciples of John, this is in verse 18, reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? How many of you know that is a weird question, knowing the history of John the Baptist? John the Baptist is the one the Lord spoke to him and said, you're going to see the heavens open and a dove come down upon somebody, and the person that this happens to is the Messiah. And John, I mean, in his, in his body, with his physical eyes, sat there. He watched Jesus walk up. He saw the heavens open up. He saw the dove come down. He heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my son. And John began to proclaim, this is the Messiah. He told his disciples, this is the one. This is, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, here at this point in his life, he's saying, are you the one or, or is this somebody else we're looking for? How did that happen? How did a man... Pressure? pressure? Could be pressure. He was in jail at the time. How many of you know if you spent a, lot, a little bit of time in jail, you might get discouraged wondering... Lord, are you really here for me? The word, oh, let's keep, keep reading here. And so when they came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one? Or shall we look for another? And I love Jesus' response here. You know, God is a big God. And if you have doubts, he doesn't go crying in a corner. He has his big boy pants on all the time. 
In that hour, it says he healed many people. Jesus didn't even give them an answer. He just healed people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, listen to this, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them. You know what Jesus is saying to them? Go tell John to believe the Bible. He's pointing back to the scriptures in Isaiah that identified who the Messiah really is. The Messiah, when he comes, he's going to be doing these things. And so Jesus said, listen, John is walking around with doubts, wondering whether I'm him or not. Tell him to go back and read Isaiah. Put his faith back in what the Word of God says. You know, I don't know why John was discouraged. Maybe it was because he was in prison. Maybe because he had an expectation that the Messiah was going to be more like a King David. A lot of people had that expectation that when Jesus came, he was going to set up the kingdom and kind of do it by force. And, and he was doing things differently. Maybe it was a, that kind of an expectation. The Bible doesn't say. But what it does say is that in the next verse, 23, the blessed is the one, Jesus is saying these words, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And I believe he's speaking there about John. The word offended is the word scandalon. To be scandalized. You ever heard that word before? The word scandalized or, or scandalon means like a trap. You ever seen those little traps you have where the, the cage is up and there's a little stick coming down? And you pull that stick and it comes, that's scandalon. That's what the Greek word means. Somehow John became scandalized. He was offended. You know, he had an expectation that wasn't met. And Jesus is saying, blessed is the man who is not offended in me. But he pointed John back to the scripture. And I'm telling you this, as sure as I'm standing here, if you have doubts today or you struggle with doubts, the answer for you is to get into the Word of God. That is the answer. No one's going to convince you with arguments and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It is the Word of God. I love, the, I love the fact that Jesus didn't spend a lot of time trying to convince John, trying to talk him out of it, trying to reason with him, why do you feel this way? He just said, John, look at the Scripture. This is what the Bible says about Messiah. Tell him what you've seen me do in this last hour. I'm the Messiah. He pointed to Scripture. He will do the same for you. There's no other answer if you're doubting. There's no other answer. You've got to go back to the Word of God. But I love the way Jesus finished this. In verse 24, when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. I can't believe that guy would stop believing in me. <laughs> After all I've done for him, he's my cousin. He saw the heavens open up. He saw the dove come. Is that what Jesus said? But why do we think that that's how Jesus would treat us if we struggle with a doubt? He just said this. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing are, and live in luxury are in king's courts. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And he says, more than a prophet. You know, Jesus honored this man. He upheld him. He, he pointed to his purpose in life. John was called to be the messenger of Messiah. And that's never changed. That's always been the purpose of God for this man. The one crying in the wilderness. And even though he was scandalized, even though he struggled with doubt, Jesus still pointed to this is who he really is. He is this messenger, more than a prophet, preparing the way for the Messiah. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. And then he says, I tell you, among those born of women, none 
is greater than John. I just love that, that he says that right here when John was scandalized. There's no one greater than this guy. Isn't that awesome how the Lord looks at us? We somehow feel like if I have a doubt that I'm going to toss this guy aside, he's just not even worth walking with me. But I'm telling you, the way Jesus looks at you, the way he always looks at you, is for the reason he created you. John was made to be the messenger. That's how he looked at him. That's how he talked about him. That's how he upheld him in the eyes of these people here. So I just want to encourage you not, not to remain in doubt. If you're in doubt about something, all I can tell you is go back to the Word of God. But I just want you to know that Jesus hasn't cast you aside. That even if you have doubts, he's looking at you and saying, I got a purpose for your life. That's what I see, and that's what I talk about. And that's how I uphold you. So I guess we're going to close with that. Let me see if there's anything else here worth. Well, I just have one last scripture in Matthew 28, verse 16. After Jesus died and he actually rose from the dead, can you imagine what it would be like if three days later somebody rose from the dead and they spent time with you, like 40 days, you're hanging out, they're walking through walls. You know, they're, you know, how can it be that a guy can walk through a wall and yet eat a fish and it doesn't fall out of his stomach? <laughs> but he, but yet he was... Mass. I mean, he said, touch me. He said, the spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I have. But yet he just, that's his resurrected body. And seeing all that, spending 40 days with him, Jesus was now ready to go up into heaven. And it says in verse 16, the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me, and it was time, like, you'd, you've done your task, you've turned over the work of the church to these 11 guys, it's time to go, and there were still some doubters, I would think, we, maybe I need to hang around for another three and a half years. But not Jesus. He knew why these guys were created. He said, he did say, wait till you get the Holy Spirit, because he's going to lead you on. But, like I told you, the Lord is not affected adversely by our doubts. He wants to minister to them, but the answer is you got to go to the Word. I want you to stand with me, and we're going to pray. So every one of us here are, are on some place in that continuum of being a person of doubt or a person of faith or, you know, somewhere just growing in between. Either way, either way, I want you to know the Lord has great compassion for every one of us. I would love to marvel the Lord Jesus Christ by my faith rather than my doubt. But either way, I'm going to marvel him. You know, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> so if there's doubts, let's start moving toward the side of faith by getting into the word of God. And if you are sincerely struggling with doubt in your life, all I can say is give yourself to the word of God. Father, I pray for this, this people here, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you, Jesus, that when, when John struggled with doubt, you pointed him back to the word. It's no different for, for us, Lord God. But I pray for any here today that are struggling with any kind of doubt, that you stir a hunger for your word. Father, I pray for those who are in desperate circumstances, that they would not see that as the, 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 the lack of favor from the Lord, but see it as an opportunity for faith to grow. Lord, let us hear about Jesus. Let us ask Jesus. And let us know, Lord, it is you who has ultimate authority and power to change any situation in our life. Father, let us be men and women of faith. I ask you to stir that up within us all, Lord God. Let us speak of your greatness. Let us talk about your wonders, Lord God. Let others hear about the wonders of Jesus Christ so that they too may find 
hope and faith birthed in their hearts and their desperate circumstances. I ask you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said, amen. Hey, take some time to share your love with one another. And if you have